Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Nyla, for inviting me to take part in this conference here today. Before I even begin, I'm going to ask all of you to just take a second and look at me. And think about what you see standing in front of you and whom you see standing in front of you. And I say that because a couple of the speakers this morning pointed out something that is absolutely true. Some of the moments in your life that would seem geared toward holding you down can be the ones that motivate you the most. I came to this country late in my teenage years. Now I went to college. It was a wonderful college. But I had this one professor who had no idea, number one, what to do with women in his class, because before it had been you know, just a male-only college and it had become co-ed. But he had no idea what to do with somebody like me. And so one day we were sitting in this economics class, and he decided to use me as an example of why it would be difficult for many of us who are going to graduate to be able to succeed. And he said, let's take Miss Tross. She's young, she's black, she's an immigrant, and she's a woman. And these four, I guess, were supposed to be strikes against me. Well, I have a little bit of a strong personality. And so I sort of stuck my hand up and I said, Professor, you know those four things you just said? They're going to work for me. And they have. And so I think all of us in our own lives, we have beautiful stories, we have sad stories, but we have things that make us get up in the morning and make us want to move on. I have been involved in international development, I think, for probably about 25 years in different kinds of capacities. I worked in academia, I worked in the private sector, and now, of course, I'm in a multilateral organization. Let me just tell you very quickly, the Organization of American States is based in Washington, D.C. It's basically kind of a small United Nations, although we've been around longer than the U.N., uh, we like to say that. There are 34 members, United States, Canada, all the countries of Latin America, and the Caribbean. And we basically focus on four broad pillars, development, security, human rights, and democracy. And for a long time, I was in charge of the development pillar. Two years ago, I met Nyla, when we were both at the United Nations and presenting at a high-level panel on entrepreneurship and innovation. I had never met this woman before. And we were coming at this topic from very different angles and working in different regions. She in Asia, me in Latin America. But something clicked, something clicked. Because we recognized in each other three things. A passion for what we did. A sense of purpose to accomplish what needed to be done. And we recognized also that not one of us can do all of this alone. We need partnership. So that sense of passion, purpose, and partnership was there. And I think it's something that, as our relationship has developed, continues to be there. And I mentioned those three because I think it's also very essential, as we're talking about inclusion and empowerment, to really go to some of these basic elements that inform what we do and how we do it and in a large measure can determine how successful we are at what we do. Because there will be failures, there will be tough moments, and there's got to be something that makes us want to keep moving forward. And so I'm really rather delighted when I came in this morning and I began chatting with people to kind of note the broad range of people that are represented here in terms of the backgrounds, in terms of the disciplines. Because each one of us, even though we might be looking at the same issue, we bring a uniqueness of perspective. And when we bring all of this together, it creates a richness in terms of how we address an issue. It helps to inform our own thinking. 
It widens our own perspective and it gives us additional options and we learn about possibilities that can actually make a, different, a difference. And so this, hopefully this is mine. <laughs> So what we're doing here today, I think, represents in a very large way an important moment of leadership for the university community to close the gaps between parallel worlds and to create some spaces for nurturing creative thinking, effective policy making, the space I inhabit, and innovative problem solving. And so while this conference in large measure was organized to really look at hometown issues, I think there's also an implicit acknowledgement that the considerations and the implications are much broader. Countries, cities, and communities everywhere are grappling with very much the same range of problems. These are on such an order of magnitude that frankly, nobody, no agency, no institution, no government can do it all by themselves. And when we talk about big 21st century issues, and some of these you heard kind of threaded through the previous presentations, we've talked about the challenge of inequality. Nobody has mentioned yet, but it's there, climate change and its implications. Complex issues of security. Refugee flows and human displacement, something I think that in San Diego knows a little bit about. The technology and innovation revolution which while it has expanded possibilities for us, it's also at the same time upending traditional notions of time and space, personal relationships, modes of communication, employment and business practice, teaching and learning. Every aspect of life as we know it has changed, meaning that we have to respond and think about things differently. And we're seeing globally connected, politically aware citizens who demand more accountability from their leaders and social justice and inclusion for the many. Indeed, you would know that members of the United Nations have just agreed to pursue 17 sustainable development goals with defined targets to be achieved over the course of the next 15 years. In short, this is such a moment of change that a lot of what we considered to be sacrosanct is being reconsidered where all the definitions of development, security, and governance are being revisited to confront new realities. And so while we talk about the San Diego community, I would suggest to you that the contours of what used to be considered the immediate neighborhood or community have changed. Proximity is no, long, is no longer a matter of geography. Competition, opportunity, challenges, have become all transboundary in scope, disrupting the way we think about policy making, program development, and partnership building. And so within this context, I wanna talk about five things very quickly. One is strategic partnerships for action. Two, since I'm on a university or in a university vicinity, education as a driver of sustainable development. Third is optimizing communities of practice or ac action networks, as I think somebody mentioned. Maybe it was for us over here. Supporting a culture of innovation, prioritizing financial inclusion, and strengthening institutions. Let's talk first about partnerships for action. The grand challenges of growth, social inclusion, and sustainability call for leadership, strategic partnership, and constructive action aimed at delivering measurable results. I don't know how many of you pay attention to the Summit of the Americas, but this past April, President Obama and 34 other presidents and prime ministers of the Americas gathered in Panama for the seventh Summit of the Americas. And what were they talking about? Well, of course, when heads get together, there are any number of issues. But really, they were talking about tackling the issue of prosperity with equity. Again, the inequality issue being one of the defining moments of our age. They discussed a menu of issues, including health, education, the environment, security, and migration. 
seeking to develop joint solutions and concrete forms of cooperation to bring all societies closer together. And I mentioned that summit because as we're here at a Global Empowerment Summit, we're also thinking about how we can harness the networks, the capacities, the resources, the ideas, the dreams, the visions, the experiences in such a way that we leave here having something concrete that we've built that can really help the people that we intend to serve and that we currently do try to serve. So today's event, I think, provides that opening for partnership building, perhaps opportunities for joint research or university-led collaborations that can impact even further the life of this community and beyond. Or as La Maestra mentioned uh, in Zara's presentation, having a circle of care that expands out and brings in people and meets them where they are. The second thing is education as the driver of sustainable and inclusive development. The inequality issue is a now challenge. Two years ago, there was a study which said the following. Investing in people's capabilities through health, education, and other public services is not an appendage of the growth process, but an integral part of it. And I believe that profoundly, having seen what education has done in my own life. It does help to provide a pathway out of poverty and improve chances for economic and social mobility. And yet, knowing this, here's a disturbing figure. 61 million children of primary school age and 70 million at the secondary level are missing out on education globally. In Latin America and the Caribbean, the area in which I work, almost 2.7 million children do not complete primary school. And 1.7 million teenagers leave a secondary school before completion. That sounds far away, but it's not because the issues in Latin America and the Caribbean, proximate as they are to these United States, have implications for policy, for program, here. And so what happens there needs to be of concern for us. The situation is especially difficult for marginalized groups and girls living in underserved areas. And while there is not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation between poverty reduction and reduction in inequality, we know that education can play a major role. And people know that. A couple of years ago, and I think I might have told you about that, a couple of years ago I did this program in Colombia called Virtual Educa. And this was focusing on innovation in education. We had 11,000 people, students, teachers, and people from the community who were bused in, not just from Medellin where we were having the event, but from in neighboring cities, wanting to be there for those two days to learn, to hear, to figure out how they could benefit from some of the initiatives that we were launching. And while we had that number of people on site, we learned later on when we got the analytics that there were more than 50,000 people who were following online. People are hungry. They want to be able to empower themselves. And I think somebody else mentioned that already this morning. Because it's not so much about parachuting in and telling people what to do. Because really, a lot of the expertise already resides in communities. And as development experts and people who are interested in working with communities, we have to give those communities the opportunity to actually put on the table some of the solutions that they have developed and work with them to actually make them sustainable. The parachuting model we've recognized doesn't work. It's spectacular. It gets lots of media. And we get another grant. It's fantastic. I've been doing this for a long time, I know. But if you want something to be sustainable, to really take hold, then it's got to be owned by the people. 
and they've got to be the ones to move it forward. All of us recognize, I think, how much of a privilege it is to work in an environment where we have the freedom to develop new ideas, implement initiatives, and establish networks and communities of practice. But I think our sense of purpose is strengthened even further when we begin to ask ourselves individually, how is my work helping to improve my community, my city, my country, my region? And how can my contribution be more effective? Once we figure that out, then we begin to seek and identify the mechanisms that can help provide a multiplier effect. And one such mechanism might be targeted knowledge sharing through the creation and optimization of communities of practice or action networks. This is something that I have a bit of experience with. A few years ago, we launched something called an Inter-American Teacher Education Network. Now it's got upwards of 20,000 teachers around the hemisphere who are very, very much engaged with each other, sharing information on curriculum development, uh, on teaching methodologies, on lesson plans, and so on and so forth. Here's what. Because of what they've been doing online, they've been able to impact and influence education policy in several countries, and also in helping us for the first time this year develop something that's called an inter-American education agenda. Getting 34 countries to agree on anything, let me tell you, is not easy. And agreeing on education, tough. But because that was already happening, where you had the practitioners who were making these decisions and already finding avenues for cooperation, it made it that much easier for policymakers to get on board. The power lies within us. Somebody asked about media. Somebody else mentioned that you have to get the story out there and then others will come along, and it's true. It's not about waiting for things to happen. It's trying to figure out how you can capitalize on what you have. And sometimes you have a brilliant idea, but if you get another 50 people, another 100 people, another 10,000 people, 20,000, and so on, then you begin to have a movement that makes a difference. And in trying to unleash potential education and other capacity building programs must provide, I think, individuals with the skill set to not only be job seekers, but job creators. One of the organizations that I work with and I serve on the board is something called Young America's Business Trust, and we're trying to do exactly that, working with youth and giving them an opportunity to develop their own entrepreneurial skills. Just this last April, on the margins of the summit in Panama, we had an opportunity to launch a talent and innovation competition of the Americas. Uh, I don't know if you were there, but it was a fantastic event. We had CEOs from all over the Americas and from Asia and from Europe who had an opportunity to see that talent and that innovative ability from so many of our teenagers. And I actually said teenagers, but that's not true because it's between 16 and 34. But, you know, teenagers as young as you feel. And we have some 34-year-olds who feel like teenagers. I could be a teenager, maybe not quite. <laughs> Here's what. This was in April. Two of our winners, one, a group from Guatemala that had this idea to promote cultural heritage. And they developed, well, I'm not as technologically as savvy as many of you in here, but what they developed was a video game that virtually recreates a centuries old Mesoamerican ball game. And so after winning the competition in April, they got publicity, they got a mentor, because we always try to pair them up with an active business executive, and they received financing to refine their product. Just a few months later, they're selling their product in the Apple Store, on Google Play, and now they're developing new products. One success has gotten this team so pumped up and so excited, and I can't wait to see what they're going to do next. And all we did was open the door, provide the training, 
a bit of capacity building, a small amount of seed money, and they're off to the races. Another team from Jamaica, they started this company that basically is a logistics company, an online platform. They're now opening up an office. Actually, they have opened up the office already. Guess where? Right here in San Diego. Young people, given the opportunity, make things happen. Women, given the opportunity, make things happen. I mentioned those two particular winners, not because there weren't more, there were. But there are a couple of things that I want for you to take away from that. Because when addressing issues of innovation and inclusion, a holistic approach can be invaluable. And we're talking about teams from two small developing countries, Guatemala and Jamaica. Size is not a determinant of capacity, nor of ability to succeed. This is something that I try to drill home all the time, because it's easy to focus on the disadvantage instead of thinking, how can I succeed? Size is not a determinant. The second, competitiveness in a global marketplace may depend less on geography than on the ability to seize opportunity. And third, innovators, wherever they may be physically located, are more empowered today than at any time in history to be active stakeholders in shaping their future. But there's a side note. Because we've been doing this for the last 10 years. And what we've seen is that the team members or the teams that actually did not win the competition tend to be the ones in the long term that are most successful. They don't win the first year. Sometimes they change the business plan. They change the product. They refine something. They come back the second year. Sometimes they still don't win. And they come back a third year because they have three opportunities. And the teams that have done best and the entrepreneurs that have been the most successful are not the ones that won the first time. It's the ones that kept trying and in the end got it right. And there's a lesson in all of that. Failure can be a huge motivator. It's not the end of the road. It's just the start of thinking where you can go next and how you can get there most effectively. But in that whole range of issues, one thing I want to highlight, and I think several people mentioned that this morning, and it goes unreported, and I think sometimes undervalued. We don't talk enough about the importance of economic and financial inclusion. I bet if I were to ask, how many people do you think, let's say globally, before we come to the United States, globally are unbanked? In other words, they're not a part of the financial system whatsoever. They have no access to credit. They have no access to banking accounts. They can't get paid uh, electronically. They have no access whatsoever to the financial system. You'd be surprised unless somebody wants to guess or knows. There might be somebody in here who knows this. The federal, the credit union guy probably knows this. <laughs> but there are two billion people in the world that are unbanked. 210 million of those are right next door in Latin America and the Caribbean. Here in the United States, lest we start getting a little complacent, in 2013, according to the FDIC, almost 28% of US households, that's a quarter, almost 28% of US households, that is over 34 million households, multiply that out by you know, how many people might be in a household, were either unbanked or underbanked. For some, of course, this is a conscious choice. But for the vast majority, 
This is a result of challenges of access or education that place them at a disadvantage for taking part in the economic mainstream. The World Bank president, Jim Young Kim, recently observed that access to finan financial services can serve as a bridge out of poverty. And the World Bank has set a goal of universal financial access by 2020, with the aim of helping to lift millions of people out of poverty. But even as institutions that are large and well-resourced, such as the World Bank, think about this, they recognize that they will require many partners, credit card companies, banks, microcredit institutions, foundations, and community leaders. Economic and financial exclusion is still leaving many behind. Community organizations, I believe, with their reach, can play an essential role here in helping to address this issue and perhaps using instruments such as microcredit and microfinancing that Women for Empowerment currently use. And so I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to say two things very quickly. Goal 16 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals calls for the promotion of just, peaceful, and inclusive societies. And in this framework, if you're thinking about that, that means strengthening institutions that safeguard a democracy and the rule of law. I work for an organization that really focuses on these issues in a big way. And some of you will know that in 2001, on September 11th, the United States and 33 other countries agreed to adopt an inter-American democratic charter that really calls for strengthening and consolidating democracy in the Americas. But even as they did that, they recognized it would not be enough, that they really needed to go beyond. Because if we're going to strengthen democracy, we have to talk about the issues of development and social justice. And so they have agreed and in 2012 adopted a social charter of the Americas. Because we needed to do that if we're going to close the credibility gap and invest in the future of democracy. This community would well recall the mass migration of unaccompanied Central American children and youth into the United States in mid-2014. And what was perceived then as a burgeoning crisis precipitated a flurry of discussion on Capitol Hill and elsewhere. But what it also highlighted is something that we've been talking about here today. And that is the structural fault lines at the national level have transboundary impact. Again, community is not what it used to be. And we have to think more broadly about that because what happens beyond the border impacts what happens within the borders. And so beyond what governments can do, academic institutions, civil society organizations, communities, I believe, have a major role to play in molding a participatory culture where individuals, regardless of gender, regardless of age, regardless of ethnicity, national origin, or economic background, have the opportunity to participate fully in all aspects of life. This all sounds good in principle, but the call for greater empowerment and inclusion remains a hollow slogan unless underwritten by concrete action and fundamentals that safeguard these basic rights and freedoms and facilitate a path toward greater social and financial independence. The question today then is, how do we harness the intellectual firepower in this audience? How do we capture the range and diversity of backgrounds at this conference to make constructive change and address the issues of empowerment, innovation, and inclusion? so that benefit is felt not just within the confines of a university, but also is reflective 
of what happens outside? How do we make it so that opportunity is not just reflective of privilege, but it's really a possibility for all? And so I hope as we continue to think about these things and try to discern the most effective ways in which we can be helpful, that we bring together and we leave here at the end of the day with a roadmap for the way forward. So this is not just another get together, not just another conference. I hope that this is the first Global Empowerment Summit, but that we will have more to come. And that the next one, we will be able to report on results from what emerged from today's session. Ultimately, I think each of us in this room is committed to helping open doors to possibility, and in so doing, expanding the horizons of those with whom we work. Empowerment, to my mind, is a 360 degree proposition. Those who are working to serve get the satisfaction of knowing that they're providing value and that they're changing a life, they're changing a family, they're changing a community for the better. And for those who receive, they have an opportunity to acquire the tools that can let them be the architects of their own future in the way that they would like to see it, empowered individuals all. Thank you again for inviting me, and I look forward to the rest of today.